So, all right, and it is the top of the hour and hello and welcome. Uh, and my name's Lucas, Lucas Livingston. I'm with the Chicago Museum. And uh, this is our third uh, uh, in our libations series that we're doing, the libation series. Uh, it's a partnership collaboration between the uh, Chicago Bruseum and Sacred Transformations. Uh, and uh, Sacred Transformations is a non-for-profit social service organization. You'll find them at tattooarttherapy.org, Chicago Bruseum, of course, at chicagobruseum.org. Uh, and uh, the Libations series is, uh, it is in conjunction with the Libations exhibition, which is being held through the month of uh, August at Fluid Coffee Bar in uh, Michigan City, Indiana. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, series is uh, uh, um, all of uh, the uh, exhibition and the series explores uh, alcohol, <clears throat> explores beverages, the celebratory aspects and ceremonial aspects of beverages uh, and the community uh, aspect of, of beverage and as well as the negative consequences of, uh, of overindulgence and, uh, and, and intoxication and alcoholism. Um, the past two weeks, so every week, every Wednesday in August is uh, one of these libations events, uh, a, a four part Zoom series. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, Eric Dean Spruth of Sacred Transfer Information, speaking about the art therapy of adult coloring last week um, was the uh, uh, addiction counselor, Lori uh, Koppinger, who was discussing uh, um, addiction and, and the triggers of trauma. And now we're going to be delving a bit more into, well, deep antiquity <laughs> for this hour. We're going to be uh, exploring uh, the, uh, the ancient aspects of uh, libations and the uh, exploration of, uh, of intoxication and, uh, and transformation, in, uh, especially in ancient Greece. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and start my, my screen share here. I'm going to just make sure I can uh, bring up the right, uh, right windows here. Give me a quick sec there. Okay, fantastic. So tonight's uh, presentation is uh, libations, um, alcohol's magic in antiquity, uh, fermentation, intoxication, metamorphosis, and madness. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mouthful there, that, that title. Uh, and uh, this is actually a talk that I gave at uh, New York University, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, uh, a number of years ago. Uh, that was, uh, here was a, um, a, 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 a workshop, a conference called the Cult Practices in uh, Ancient Literatures. And uh, just recently, the uh, paper actually, and even though the, the, the workshop happened in 2016, uh, very recently, the paper was actually published, the proceeding, proceeds from the proceedings from the conference. Uh, and so I think actually, gosh, I think I can actually just click that link and show it, bring it up here. So if anybody wants a good read, this is a, a, a rather abridged version of the, um, uh, the paper that I uh, delivered uh, way back when. Uh, but what we're gonna have uh, now is a much more uh, uh, in-depth conversation, in-depth discussion of uh, the uh, aspects of, uh, yeah, in intoxication, fermentation, metamorphosis, and madness in the ancient Greek world. Should be a, a lot of fun. Um, let, me, let me bring back this here. So w first though, um, We've been discussing libations for the past couple of weeks uh, with this series, and I want to take a, a minute to explore libations and what that's really all about. Uh, and uh, you know, the the hazards of being a, an ancient uh, historian is that I, I spent far longer than I really care to studying ancient languages, and so often I um, uh, will choose to inflict that misery on um, those who happen to be listening to me. Um, so. Uh, you're going to get, you, if for, for those who really care, we got the, the Latin origin of libations up there, meaning just to, to pour an offering or, or a, a drink offering, uh, a liquid form that is, is poured. And we see going um, across the, really across the world and across cultures and across time, the idea of pouring a liquid 
uh, in uh, honor uh, of uh, one's ancestors or uh, as an offering to a divinity or to the gods, uh, to ancestral spirits. This is something that we see uh, um, really as one of these, these hallmarks of, of just kind of um, uh, 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 universal aspects of, of devotion, the idea of pouring some sort of liquid offering. Uh, and we see, much as we see other universal aspects of, of devotion, like uh, the idea Idea of, of maybe putting one's hands together or hands upraised in supplication, or uh, we can certainly think of a few more ideas of, uh, of universal aspects that we find to, to religious practice across the world. But the libation is certainly one of those. Uh, in today, where we encounter the word libation, perhaps most most frequently being being used uh, in a, 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 in in its sacred context, that is, so um, that would be uh, well, of course, in in its secular context, libation is you know whatever you happen, whatever alcoholic beverage you might and choose to be enjoying at the moment. But uh, we find the most prevalent usage of the term libations in its spiritual context is found uh, really across Africa uh, and. Uh, certainly among uh, the descendants of the African diaspora spread across the world, especially in the West and especially in, in America amongst uh, African Americans and black culture, there's a real strong resurgence in the uh, 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 significance of the libation as a, uh, a form of uh, 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 honoring and uh, respect to one's cherished ancestors. And it can be whether it's, it's water, beer, wine, hard alcohol, and other cultures we encounter uh, uh, libation offerings in the form of milk or olive oil, uh, other types of oils as well. So really just about anything that is a liquid and can be poured um, and customarily a type of beverage that might be consumed. Uh, so yeah. Um, another interesting um, uh, manifestation of uh, libations in contemporary practice, even going back some centuries as well, we find in uh, the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal, in the Himalayas, we find uh, this really interesting mask, masks of this sort, large uh, uh, representations of the Hindu deity Bhairava, uh, which is the, 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 the wrathful uh, um, guise, the wrathful expression the wrathful uh, manifestation of the god Shiva. Shiva, one of the prominent divinities of the Hindu faith. And these masks of Bhairava, there is uh, a, a prominent uh, festival that happens in Nepal, in the Kathmandu Valley, uh, uh, called the Indra Chatra uh, festival uh, or, or, or yenya is another word for it. Don't worry, it's not gonna be on the quiz later. Uh, but it's this long festival, like the largest um, street religious street festival that happens in Nepal. And it lasts for eight days with, with grand processions and parades. And um, throughout that festival, uh, one encounters the, uh, these, these large shrines uh, of Bhairava where you note, this is great, this is at the, in the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City. Uh, note in the mouth of this mask, there is a little spout, a little copper pipe that's sticking out of the mouth. And actually I got a video here, hopefully this will play, um, that shows in this ceremonial uh, moment of the, the Indra Chatra festival, where this liquid libation pours from the mouth of um, Bhairava, pours from the mouth of the divinity here. Uh, and it's just, uh, actually the things that they're pouring, uh, it can, sometimes it could be a, a type of a distilled spirit, a hard alcohol, but, uh, just as often it would be uh, beer, actually, rice beer. I love that. So, uh, chong or uh, a type of rice, fermented rice drink in the, in the, in the Indian regions. Uh, so you can see that pouring from this long spout to the people below. And so, and then to receive the liquid is wonderful blessing of giving you the gift of the God to bestow upon you to receive that into your life. So it can get pretty raucous. I don't think that this fight is a good thing that people are dressing up in the past. This is examples of libations in the past. 
contemporary life. I mean, it, it's, it's certainly it, traditions that go back centuries, millennia, but it's still very much an aspect of contemporary life. Uh, I think I showed this uh, image. Um, this, some of these slides uh, I, I showed a, um, uh, a, a few months ago when I was doing my, uh, my, my talk for the Chicago Museum on uh, drinking games and history. Uh, if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to chicagobruseum.org and then at the bottom of the page, you scroll and you find links to the, the YouTube channel uh, as well as the Facebook page. And there we have um, the, vid the videos uh, are, are published up. I don't think, I don't think the um, drinking games and history was um, put on, we were broadcasting it to Facebook live at the time um, but it, so it's not on Facebook but it's definitely on the YouTube channel <clears throat> so check it out but uh, yeah so here libations going back to ancient Pompeii 2000 years ago uh, almost and um, this is great where this, this detail of uh, a fresco shows this uh, what's called a lar l a r it's like a like a household god uh, in ancient rome so an image of this this household deity who's lifting up a uh, uh, a drinking vessel like a like a drinking horn uh, we'll explore that a little more closely in a moment and this liquid is is, is uh, spewing out of the the bottom of the drinking horn and hopefully seeming like he's trying to make uh, make it strike this this other um, vessel this this bucket that he's holding I and mean, it looks like he's spilling as much as uh, as he's getting it in there um, but this is a, yeah this is a really interesting um, action that we're going to explore in a little bit uh, some more the idea of these these um, uh, well we'll see a detail and uh, we have another detail and not not at so much a detail here but we have another image of the same action, lifting the vessel aloft. It's called a riton, R-H-Y-T-O-N. Um, those of you who know me know I'm a, I'm a real uh, geek fan of the, the riton vessel, or, or rita, as it's called, this ancient style of vessel. And again, just trying to inflict some etymology on you there, uh, coming, the, the word riton is a kind of a cryptic ancient word coming perhaps it's thought maybe um, from um, from uh, reo or reto meaning to flow from ancient Greeks um, but I also tossed in there just for good measure um, some uh, the word keras which is a more common word that one would, would find in reference to a, a drinking horn I, I mentioned these things look like drinking horns but um, so keras is strictly a drinking horn riton is this type of a, a vessel which um, what what does Distinguishes a riton from other types of, uh, of, of drinking horns? Uh, well, you know, it's a great, good question, uh, actually. Um, oh, yeah, I did mention that uh, this, this drinking games, uh, uh, I just tossed this slide in here to um, just give you a visual reference if you're interested in checking out. You can check out the drinking games in history. So I'm going to gloss over a lot of the, the kind of the gamification of that, that spouted vessel um, pouring the liquid out, because we covered that already in the drinking games uh, um, past discussion. But uh, here, the Riton is this uh, extremely popular type of, of drinking vessel from antiquity. Uh, and it was used not only for, for drinking, um, for enjoyable drink, but then also for, uh, it was used for uh, libations. And that's what we saw a lot uh, in the case of holding this, the, 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 the Lars, I should go back a couple slides here. So the Lars here, the um, Lars is holding it uh, and, and decanting not into one's mouth, but into this, this bucket. And here there's just three examples, really beautiful, uh, Brighton vessels from the Metropolitan's collection in, in New York uh, from uh, <clears throat> uh, Achaemenid, Seleucid, Parthian uh, empires, dynasties, the Persians basically, ancient Persia, lovely silver vessels. Often they would have a hole in the mouth or maybe just below the mouth where the liquid would, would pour forth. So you fill it from the large, uh, uh, like, um, well, from the, 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 the neck of the vessel and then it spews out the mouth if it's a ritual libation vessel. Otherwise, if they, it's not a ritual libation vessel, they won't, it won't have that hole in the mouth and then it's meant for drinking or just for show. And it goes back really far into ancient history, uh, 14th to 13th century BC, this Hittite, that's ancient Turkey, Anatolia ancient Turkey, this Hittite uh, bull headed vessel. Uh, it's a, a great thing. In ancient Greece, the Greeks just loved this, this style of vessel and adopted it. Uh, here's a great uh, couple examples. They don't, aren't always in, the, in uh, um, the, the sort of drinking horn shape, 
the image at right you see is actually uh, very much like a hoof, a, ho a bovine hoof. And at left is a donkey, but it has a nice little little uh, stand that built into it, a little stem that it can sit on so it doesn't tip over. Uh, I love these two examples here. They're kind of the odd, the odd shapes though. Uh, we saw a bunch of other examples that don't have that stem. And um, very often though, uh, the they are a fundamentally a horizon vessel is fundamentally it's a, a drinking mug in the shape of an animal's head uh, or other body parts but really often it's uh, the shape of an animal's head and those animals aren't just any type of animal but they're typically the animals that are the um, same animals that might be used for animal sacrifices so like sacrificial victims you could say so yeah donkeys goats uh, um, deer uh, sheep etc uh, um, etc et so uh, this is you know, really, really fun, meaningful uh, Raiton example to me uh, that is uh, uh, in the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, this is a, a sh an object that, that, that's been near and dear to me for many years. Uh, one of my favorite objects in, in the museum. Uh, so this coming from the real high classical period of ancient Greece and um, when you, you uh, I, I, just fun things about this, um, this, this, this vessel, we covered it already in our drinking games discussion um, a few months ago, but I'll just reiterate, you know, the, how, how do you, how do you set it down? Yeah. Yeah. That's the tricky thing about it. You can't really set it down. I see a few heads shaking, right? You, you I mean, you, you pretty much have to polish off your beverage before you can set it down. Uh, in this great photo here, it's probably gently resting against some sort of uh, an arm holding it up, but that's all uh, modern construction. The, the handle is is, is original. Um, however, it, you can't stand it upright if it's filled with liquid. It'll just tip over. You have to, the only way you set it down is is, is really upside down. And so you got to polish off your drink first. So I think, and of course, you never give them that chance. There's always somebody, these are used in drinking parties. There's always somebody going around and refilling your mug. Uh, and, and they're not drinking water. Here they're drinking any ancient Greece drinking wine. Uh, and so, it, yeah, the, the shape, in a sense, kind of uh, uh, encourages you to, to drink and, and lends itself to uh, inebriation and intoxication of the, the, the bearer of this vessel. And uh, the other thing is also, I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to drink from it? That's what I always wonder. And you think, okay, well, you could, if you grab it like a normal mug and you lift it up, you, you, that ear, I wonder if the, the ear will probably get in the way and uh, you might very well just, just dribble on yourself. Uh, you could perhaps do it upside down. So when you tick, uh, tilt it back, the, 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 the handle is pointed upwards, but that's a little awkward because then you're drinking upside down. Uh, it just doesn't look right in my mind. <laughs> um, but no, my money's on that you would grab the handle from the underside and uh, tilt it up to your, your face. And as you're wanting to polish off your beverage, uh, holding it aloft, then all of a sudden, basically you, you've, you've got the face of an ass. Um, pardon, pardon my speech there, but uh, this idea of <clears throat> alcohol as this almost uh, transformative magical type of elixir that turns the drinker into these these beasts, these animalistic forms, like a donkey, like a a, a bull, a, a goat, or whatever. This is a recurring uh, motif that we find throughout ancient Greece, especially in, in Greece and other ancient cultures as well. But it really is is prominent in ancient Greece, uh, and the it, this recurring motif in not only in visual arts but also in the literary in uh, uh, magic and religion and cult practice, this idea of, of alcohol, equating alcohol with this, with this transformation, uh, alcohol, whether it's as a magical elixir. And this is what we'll get into maybe at towards, towards the end of our conversation here is, is why. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of examples of this. And then towards the end, we're going to ask ourselves, okay, well, why? Uh, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically you hold this up and you become uh, an, an ass through, through, uh, through drink. Um, so 
Yes, fun, fun times in ancient Greece. Uh, here we have, you know, actually, and I mentioned in magic too. So this is just a fun little statue I tossed in just for fun. Uh, but uh, there's actually ancient Greek magical spells to uh, uh, to make uh, to turn party goers to turn uh, drunk people after their drinking party and they're out wandering the streets uh, uh, trying to make their way back home there's this magical spell that can transform them into uh, into asses basically so uh, I'll just read this quote here it's a real simple sweet short simple uh, magic spell anybody can do it at home um, but uh, to to make men who have been drinking at a symposium symposium is the ancient greek word for drinking parties you know we think of these uh, times when professors get together have a little wine and cheese and uh, after reading some papers you know in ancient greece they they skipped the papers and went straight to the the, the wine some maybe some optional cheese it's the ancient greek word for a drinking party is a symposium basically so to make men who've been drinking at a symposium appear to have donkey snouts to outsiders from afar. And this is how you do it. In the dark, you take a wick from a lamp, you dip it in donkey's blood, and then you make a new lamp with the new wick and you touch the drinkers. That's all you got to do. Very simple. I told you anybody could do it, but I, I haven't tried it. Uh, try it at your own risk. Uh, we do not necessarily uh, endorse or encourage this behavior, but there you go. Then, as I said, we find it, yes, in, in the visual arts, we find it, uh, this idea of alcohol uh, associated with animalistic transformation. We find it in magical spells. And then we find it also in literature. And here's a great example of the, where literature uh, and mythology and, and the visual arts combine on this wonderful uh, cup from uh, from the Metropolitan, or sorry, from the MFA uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. This is a great, wonderful cup. I call it a cup. It looks like a a big bowl or a tureen, and it's it's substantial, um, but it's it's a style of drinking cup from uh, from ancient Greece called a kylix, K Y L I X, uh, kylix drinking cup, and uh, the what it represents here is a passage, a scene, a moment from uh, the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, I'll read that. Uh, well, first to set the stage here, actually. Uh, so Odysseus and his, his men are sailing the, what's, uh, what Homer calls the wine dark sea. That's the Mediterranean, the wine dark sea. I just love that. And so sailing the Mediterranean on their way home from the Trojan War, right? That whole big long uh, uh, escapade uh, and uh, the, the, the Trojan horse and all of that stuff that, that happened. And now they're, they're finding their way back home to, uh, to, to Greece, to Ithaca, uh, Odysseus king of Ithaca in Greece, uh, but it it takes them a long time to get home. Actually, uh, what was it about? It was it ten years, uh, and uh, or is it twenty? No, it's ten years. Ten years, yeah, ten years to fighting in the Trojan War. Ten years to get back home because they keep running into all kinds of uh, adventures. Uh, basically, the gods inflicting punishment on uh, Odysseus and his men, uh, and so they crash land on this island, uh, and Odysseus and his men they draw lots and they, was, they see who was going to go investigate the island. They see some smoke coming off from the center of the island, this wooded island. And so a few men pull the, the short straws and they go off in search of what this source of the smoke is. And they happen upon this uh, um, uh, hut, this house of, uh, of, of a woman named Circe, uh, actually who's a, a sorceress and they don't quite know it yet. And they, she thinks she's okay, but uh, she welcomes them in. And it says here, and then she, she mixed for them a potion uh, with barley and cheese and pale honey added to Pramnian wine. Uh, but she put into the mixture malignant drugs to make them forgetful of their own country. And when uh, she'd given them this and they drunk it down, next she struck them with her wand and drove them into her pig pens. And they took on the, the look of pigs with the heads and voices and bristles of pigs, but the minds within them stayed as had been before. So we see we see this this very moment happening depicted on this cup, and this is a great uh, like narrative uh, um, trope in in ancient Greece. Uh, the way they show m two moments conflated happening at the same time uh, on here, while Circe, the uh, large uh, human figure in the the center here, is handing the cup 
over to Odysseus's men, Odysseus's men are already in this state of mid transformation, turning into pigs, except for a couple chaps back here and over there at the right. But uh, so this is this interesting uh, conflation of of time and narrative in the uh, in on on this vessel here. Uh, what I also love about this is that um, uh, is that the vessel that she is handing has this magical potion that's going to turn them into pigs. This vessel she's handing to them is approximately in the same shape as the large vessel on which this painting is depicted. Uh, and so I think then this whole idea, this prevalence of, of alcohol and, and, and intoxication transforming you into pigs or, 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 or jackasses. One wonders if the, the person drinking from this cup, looking at this picture, was thinking and wondering themselves, am I going to turn into a pig if I drink from this vessel as well as this Circe's elixir within, you know, well, certainly keep drinking and find out, you know, if you drink this much, you might very well turn into a pig. I don't know. But um, uh, I just tossed in a couple images here of um, Mycenae, ancient Mycenae. You know, these are the people Homer was, was writing about, looking back to the ancient heroic past, uh, writing in much later around the, in the eighth century uh, BC, the Iron Age of Greece, but writing about the Bronze Age, Greece's this, uh, mythologized heroic past. But they knew that there was this vestige of knowledge of the ancient Mycenaean civilization, but they were so elevated and, and heroicized um, to become these, these people of legends. So uh, ancient Mycenae here, the Lion's Gate, the supposed palace of King Agamemnon, and then this su supposed desk, death mask of King Agamemnon. I mean, it's, it's not. We don't know if there really ever was an Agamemnon, uh, uh, but this, and this uh, actually would really far predate, uh, um, well, 16th century, uh, the, 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 the creation of these Homeric epics um, passed down through oral tradition centuries uh, earlier. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a great example. And then this, this beautiful drinking cup, a golden chalice uh, from, from the ancient Mycenaean Greek civilization, the Bronze Age uh, of, of ancient Greece. Uh, the, and this is uh, so-called Nestor's cup. There are a few different Nestor's cups out there. Uh, uh, maybe it's like, you know, uh, like, like I, uh, fragments of the cross or something, but uh, the so-called Nestor's cup coming also from a passage from Homer, not from the Odyssey, but this time from the Iliad. King Nestor, uh, ancient Mycenaean Greek king. Uh, so it, it, this, uh, it, d there's a passage in the Iliad that basically describes, visually describes uh, King Nestor's cup. And I'm just going to toss this in, even though it doesn't have much to do with our, our whole thesis on transformation, but it's just a good passage. Um, so this, this uh, um, uh, uh, description here, uh, it says, uh, let me find it. So there was a cup of rare workmanship, which uh, the, the old man Nestor had brought with him from home. So from home, here they're at the at the Trojan War fighting, but he brings his favorite cup with him. That's great. Studded with bosses of gold, it had four handles on each of which there were two golden doves feeding, and it had two feet to stand on. Um, so a very passing resemblance to the cup that we have here. Anyone else could hardly have been able to lift it from the table when it was full, but Nestor could do so quite easily. And in this uh, woman, fair as a goddess, she mixed them a mess with Pramnian wine, and she grated goat's milk cheese into it with a bronze grater, threw in a handful of white barley meal, and having thus prepared the mess, she bade them to drink. So that, that's interesting. You read it closely, and it actually gives you this, this recipe for what the Mycenaeans and supposedly the uh, people from the, the Trojan War, what they were actually drinking on the, the eve of battle. And same thing, that potion that Circe mixed them was, was also this mixture of barley and, and wine and honey. And you think, okay, well, that's a curious mixture, especially this one here having grated goat's milk cheese in it. Uh, and you think, okay, well, 
we have these fine tastings of, of wine and cheese and uh, even craft beer and cheese. And, uh, you know, why not? Uh, it's, it's all going in the same place. Why not just mix them all together in, in the same bite, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, interestingly, there's, there's archaeological evidence for uh, this uh, type of drink, this, this, this type of recipe, this mixture, this, um, this uh, uh, mixture of barley and grapes and honey. Uh, if you co-ferment all of these, what do you call Do you call that beer? Do you call that wine? Do you call it mead? It's this interesting blending of, of all of these uh, fermented ingredients. And uh, so, but actually going back to um, the, again, ancient Anatolia, uh, here we have, so ancient Turkey, we have the tomb of King Midas. It's not actually the tomb of King Midas. It's now realized it's the tomb of his father, King Gordius. Okay, you want to split hairs there. Uh, but in the 50s, University of Pennsylvania did excavations of this, this mound uh, we see it right is a fanciful uh, um, uh, uh, modern illustration of what we think the, the funerary feast before the large tumulus burial mound of King Gordius, what it might have looked like. And then on the inside, we have these lovely, uh, um, lovely copper and bronze uh, objects and micro residue analysis from the dried up remains of the insides of these uh, um, vessels gives us uh, the uh, basic ingredients of the beverage that they drank during the funerary feast of King Gordius. And it is very much this uh, shows the trace signatures of uh, fermented grapes, uh, barley and honey. So this the same type of beverage that they were drinking in the Trojan War. This is really interesting. Uh, a lot of this work was done by uh, Dr. Pat McGovern at the University of Pennsylvania. And some of us uh, uh, avid drinkers here might uh, be, uh, and beer fans might uh, <clears throat> have some alarm bells going off because, um, but you, because you, you may well know that this is the, uh, uh, um, the recipe for the modern uh, recreation of that, which is dogfish heads Midas touch. Right, so Midas Touch, you can still buy it uh, commercially available in stores as part of their Ancient Ales series, a collaboration between Pat McGovern, University of Pennsylvania, and Dogfish Head. Uh, and so there it is, Midas Touch. And uh, many of you who know me know that I uh, do a lot of dabbling and well, more than dabbling in home brewing, uh, brewing my own beers and inspired by these ancient traditions. So uh, back in 2015, and I recreated it also more recently, just last year, uh, I took my own stab at uh, creating uh, an ancient uh, um, uh, recipe similar to this. And so I call it Circe's Elixir. <laughs> you can uh, find that online. I've got uh, just uh, my own uh, vanity homebrew, morgue brewing, long story how it got that name, morgue brewing, um, but it's a fun story. Um, but uh, you, can, you can actually visit morguebrewing.com. It just takes you to my uh, other website, the Ancient Art Podcast. And uh, I have a blog set up for uh, home brewing there. Uh, and so you can, you can peruse all of my uh, exploits in uh, trying to recreate ancient ales as well as some modern things as well and uh, go back as far as 2016 and you can find Circe's Elixir where I uh, include uh, details of what we're discussing here <laughs> as well as uh, the actual recipe if you want to try to make it at home and all of my notes. <laughs> so you can, you can check that out at your, at your leisure. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, I guess, I, I, I don't know, I tossed this in, image in here again, um, <clears throat> just to remind us, going back to the uh, idea that our, our, our main uh, exploration here of alcohol as this, this recurring uh, theme, this association between uh, alcohol, fermentation, intoxication with uh, um, transformation or, or metamorphosis and, and even madness as well. Uh, and we find uh, on another beautiful Kylex cup, this is what the inside of a Kylex cup would look like. Not, it's not, the, it's just a different Kylex from the Circe cup, but uh, this is the Dionysus cup. <laughs> uh, here's another uh, great representation uh, of uh, a story of uh, an association again of wine, or alcohol with um, transformation 
this scene depicted here is a, a rather playful tale of uh, Dionysus versus the Tyrrhenian pirates, the god Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, uh, theater, reverie, and madness. Uh, and is, uh, well, one day he decides to go on a, a pleasure cruise. Um, uh, well, actually, he's, there's a few different ways that the story is told. Um, <clears throat> one is he's just walking along the banks. The other is, version of the story is he's out on his own boat sailing along the, uh, along the sea. But he, and as the god of wine, he is very punch drunk uh, and in an inebriated stupor. <laughs> uh, but then this, this band of pirates comes by and they see, oh, look at this, this young, handsome uh, man dripping with all sorts of fineries and gold and such. And so he must be a really uh, uh, wealthy prince. So let's, let's abduct him and hold him for ransom. And so they do so. This comes, the, the tale is told in um, uh, Homeric hymn, uh, hymn number seven, if you know, if you want to go look it up, Homeric hymn number seven, the hymn, uh, hymn to Dionysus. And uh, <clears throat> so Dionysus is, is captured by these pirates and they uh, lash him to the, the, uh, the mast of their ship. Uh, and then as uh, the, it was interesting because they try to tie him up, but then magically the bonds just slip from, from uh, around him. And so they think, okay, well, something's fishy there. If we can't tie up this, this prince, what's going on here? Uh, and then as he slowly starts to come to, he realizes Dionysus wh where he is and he's not where he should be. And who are these ruffians threatening him? And so uh, it, it, he decides to exact his, re his revenge, his vengeance. I mean, even though Dionysus is... Uh, god of of reverie and 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 wine it's never wise to piss off a god he can still be just as wrathful as the next god and so here's what happens it says uh, first of all sweet fragrant wine ran streaming through all the black ship and the heavily and the heavenly smell arose so that all of the 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 seamen the pirates were seized with amazement when they saw it and all at once a vine spread out both ways along the top of the sails with many clusters of grapes hanging down from it and a dark ivy plant twined around the mast, blossoming with flowers and rich berries growing from it. <clears throat> then the helmsman of the ship realizes, okay, you know, maybe this isn't who we thought uh, he was and maybe we ought to probably let him go. The other pirates are like, no, no, no. Okay, we're going to still hang on to him. And, uh, uh, and so uh, then uh, Dionysus continues to um, exact his revenge. He causes all of these phantasms to manifest on the ship, like literally, quite literally different readings of the story, lions, tigers, and bears, right? Uh, everyone in unison, oh my, drink. And so then the pirates finally freak out as these like lions and bears and such are jumping at them <clears throat> and they all jump overboard into the water. And as their bodies touch the water, the pirates are transformed into dolphins. So it's this interesting, it's, it's a, it's not an immediate like association of drink wine turn into dolphin, but still this, the same idea of, uh, of the, the wine splashing through the ship, the, the wrath of the god Dionysus, god of wine, and the transformation into animals. And if we rewind to the, the other cup, you can see the dolphins flitting and floating about the bottom. Those are the poor, poor pirates. And this is an interesting uh, mosaic from Tunisia that uh, shows these, um, the, the pirates in this hybridized state of transformation. <clears throat> And uh, this uh, Dionysus is in the, the pretty blue dress here, actually. Uh, Dionysus generally has often a, a bit of a more uh, effeminate and androgynous uh, appeal, a, 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 a representation. Uh, this portly fellow here, you might think, okay, well, that's, that's the, the big jolly Dionysus that I know and love, the Bacchus, right? The Roman uh, equivalent of Dionysus um, for all intents and purposes. There's a difference between them. But uh, that, we'll get into him in a moment. That's not actually Dionysus. That's a fellow named Salinus, who's his, his Dionysus's tutor, taught him everything he knew. Um, if you're interested and, and want to check out more, uh, actually, 
my uh, my other thing is the Ancient Art Podcast, and I did a whole episode on Dionysus and the pirates. So you can go over to ancientartpodcast.org and check that out and listen to that episode and goes in depth into this whole story and a, a detailed analysis of a couple of these works of art and such. So that's all over at ancientartpodcast.org. There's the whole transcript there, but you can also just watch it on, on YouTube. And while you're there, you can uh, subscribe to my newsletter and, and check out more episodes of the ancient art podcast <laughs> enough of that the uh, other fun thing about this this very vessel of uh, Dionysus and the pirates on the inside is the pirate ship on the outside are these big glaring eyes that stare at you from the bottom uh, as you are drinking it holding it up to your uh, up to your mouth drinking from this cup the eyes stare out at your fellow symposiasts as they're called your your fellow drinkers at this party these big bulging glaring eyes there's another example here of one of these eye cups they're called um in, in, on loan to the art institute so you hold it up and and it's thought then that the the handles become like ears the eyes of, of a, uh, a creature glaring out at you the stem is like a snout and so it's it's like you put on a mask of sorts, a mask of a, a pig or a mask of a, a, a donkey or, uh, or something. And so this idea, again, this is interesting. Dionysus, god of, of wine, madness. Uh, Dionysus also god of, uh, of theater. And so it's like you're donning this theatrical mask of sorts too. So it's interesting conflation of all of that. Dionysus, I mentioned, is uh, often represented as a, a somewhat androgynous looking uh, divinity, uh, very youthful uh, oftentimes, especially later in the Roman era and in the uh, Hellenistic Greek period, he's, he's rather youthful. He's really exoticized and equated by the Greeks, uh, the ancient Greeks, as being a, more of a, a foreign God from, from far off lands, uh, it thought that he grew up actually as the God, uh, the, the son of Zeus and a, uh, a nymph named Semele. <clears throat> he didn't grow up in Greece. He was raised uh, uh, being like a, a bastard child uh, born out of wedlock. Uh, you know, Zeus is married to Hera. So he was raised uh, in, in hiding in various places, whether it was uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, um, but very often later it kind of gets uh, settled that it comes from, from India. And so he's often represented with these flowing robes and, and something like a turban wrap on his head, this, this, uh, this, this, this mm, uh, ancient Greek idea of what uh, Indians and, and Easterners would uh, look like. And so he's also accompanied often with this great retinue of uh, different uh, creatures, uh, uh, many eccentric followers, including Selenus, as I mentioned, also satyrs, these, these goat-like creatures, maenads, and, and uh, Pan, Pan, the, the uh, uh, goat-like god, uh, and, and leopards as well. We have these leopards, the sacred animal, of, or panthers, sacred animal of Dionysus. Uh, Satyrs, we encountered also satyrs, this, this sort of permanent hybridized state between uh, human and animal, half man, half goat, or actually early on, it's, whether it's half, half goat or half horse, it's a bit debatable. Um, the difference between a satyr and a fawn, that gets conflated already in ancient Greek times. So uh, we're, we're not going to try to split those kinds of hairs there. But uh, this interesting idea of this, this permanent state of mid-transformation as satyrs are always running around, uh, never wearing pants, and uh, always intoxicated. So they're, they're the, the, the epitome of uh, a Dionysiac uh, a transformation. This, uh, yeah, this big portly fellow you might think of as Dionysus or Bac Bacchus is Selenus. This is a much, of course, much, much later, very modern uh, representation of Selenus at the wine vat. And we see a pan behind him and, and, uh, and, and a Perhaps a, a satyr here is trying to fill his cup, you can tell, because he has slightly pointy ears. So Selenus, this portly tutor of Dionysus, uh, there are all sorts of great stories uh, around Selenus as well, and touching on this, 
this aspect of transformation. There's a couple nice representations of Selenos uh, from ancient Rome. And uh, this, this great jug, <laughs> a wine jar that shows Selenos uh, and the legend of King Midas. Uh, we're gonna, we, we'll cut to the um, chase here uh, a bit, uh, kind of starting to run a bit out of time, but uh, there, there's a couple stories involving Selenos and Dionysus. One story that Selenus and, and Dionysus and his band of merry followers were parading along and Selenus, as always, was, was drunk and hanging out in the back and wanders off and, uh, and uh, gets separated from the rest of the group. And then he happens upon this fountain uh, that is spewing wine. So Selenus thinks, okay, well, you know, my buzz is starting to wear off. I might as well dip in some more. So you see him here, at, right, drinking from this fountain of wine. And that was a trap set up by King Midas, who knew Selenus was coming through, and he wanted to capture Selenus and extract all of his ancient wisdom. Uh, and so uh, in, in that one version of the tale, um, Selenus is captured by uh, King Midas, and uh, the, the wisdom that Selenus uh, gave to Midas wasn't exactly what Midas was uh, hoping for. It was something to the effect of, oh, well, you humans live such very short lives on earth. It's better just not to be born at all or something of that nature. So kind of grim. But of course, the more interesting story we know about uh, Midas is, yes, yeah, he of the golden touch, uh, ordained that everything I touch shall turn to gold. We, we know that whole story. But the, the background of it is that uh, King Midas, in, in this case, uh, actually uh, rescued Silenus, who, again, was wandering the fields drunk and, and not knowing where he was. So King Midas recognized, oh, well, this is Silenus, and he is very respected. He's part of Dionysus's retinue, so we better, better take care of him. So eventually, Dionysus figured out where his tutor, his, his, his pal, his sidekick is, came to the court of King Midas, saw how wonderfully Midas had treated Dion, uh, Silenus and said, okay, okay, Silenus, uh, thanks for taking care of Midas, of, uh, uh, okay, Midas, thanks for taking care of Silenus for me. Uh, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a gift. You get, you get one wish, anything you want. What, what do you want, Midas? And of course, we all know what, we all know what Midas wished for, the golden touch. Dionysus is like, okay, you know, are you sure? Did you really, you think, think it through now, Midas, think it through. <laughs> So no, anyway, yeah, we know we know how that ends up. Actually, um, the whole uh, uh, um, uh, idea of Midas touching his daughter, as we see here, and turning her to gold, we don't find that in the ancient version of the tale. That happens much much later in Nathaniel Hawthorne version uh, retelling of the tale. Um, but still, it makes makes for 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 good 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 stuff, good legends here. Um, <clears throat> Maynads, we, so we already encountered the um we encountered the uh, um, uh satyrs the the masculinized uh, followers of dionysus and then maenads are the feminine followers of dionysus and the women uh, they're not in a hybridized state but uh, more interestingly they maenads are uh, uh, indicative of alcohol's effect to transform in mind rather than in body. Uh, there are, uh, um, it, it, maenads are these, you have these women worshipers of Dionysus, and they, it's said that they, they could be, you know, the, the girl next door, or, or, or uh, every ancient Greek uh, husband probably feared that his wife was secretly a maenad, stealing off into the middle of night to go into the forests and have these, these Bacchic reveries, worshiping Dionysus and getting punch drunk and doing who knows what. And, well, one of the things that the uh, maenads did in their supposed um, Bacchic orgies uh, was something called sparagmos. And sparagmos was uh, something where they would be so uh, enthused, is the word, to be filled with the god, enthusiasmos, so, so filled with the presence of Dionysus and probably plenty of wine too, uh, that they would, they would think themselves transformed into beasts of the wild and then run in through the woods, chasing down live game, deer and, and rabbits and rending them limb from limb uh, and, and consuming their raw flesh. So it's kind of gruesome, but this is, this is what the, um, this is what uh, certainly the excuse that Athenian men had to, uh, to make sure that their, um, their wives were not allowed out uh, at night or at day. It was not a very liberal society. Uh, perhaps the most famous 
Latin version of the Sparagmos comes from Euripides Bacchae, where, uh, uh, again, this idea of, uh, of, of transformation in mind, Dionysus tricks um, uh, uh, um, King Pentheus, who had uh, outlawed the worship of Dionysus in his land, and it's never a good thing to, again, piss off a god. And so King, King Pentheus uh, uh, goes to spy. He's curious. He outlaws Dionysus, but he's curious what this is all about. And so he goes to spy on um, some maenads who are worshiping in the woods. And then uh, Dionysus, he's, he's watching. And so he uh, tricks the maenads into thinking that Pentheus is actually a wild boar. And so they, uh, in their, uh, their Sparagmos enthused rage, chase down King Pentheus and tear him limb from limb. Uh, it's, it's particularly gruesome and this this wonderful example from the Kimball uh, Museum in, in Texas uh, this uh, poor poor King Pentheus there uh, but actually what's interesting is the, the two women grasping the fragments of King Pentheus is uh, Pentheus's own mother and his aunt who were secretly worshipers of Dionysus he just didn't realize it we're we're starting to uh, run out of some time here but I just I want to uh, show off the Lycurgus cup. It's another great example of transformation and, and uh, equation with Dionysus and wine. Uh, the Lycurgus is just like King Pentheus. Lycurgus outlawed the worship of Dionysus in his kingdom. Uh, and uh, Dionysus, of course, gets his revenge uh, on, on him. Uh, there's a, a quote here so saying that uh, Dionysus, da, 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 oh, cut to the uh, chase here. Um, so that King, King uh, Lycurgus had uh, locked up all of the, the Bacchae or the Maenads taken captive along with the congregation of satyrs that accompanied him. And then later on, the Bacchae were suddenly set free and Dionysus caused Lycurgus to go mad. And in this state, thinking he was cutting a vine branch, Lycurgus killed his son Dryas by cutting off his arms and legs with an ax. This uh, cup from in the British Museum, ancient Roman cup, it's a really marvelous example of this cage cut glass work. This is all thick glass that is very carefully chiseled and carved in to create this wonderful relief work, uh, all open work uh, by master gem carvers from ancient Rome. And we spin it around and we see there's decoration on all side. At left is uh, the part of it shows uh, pan. At right there's, uh, if you keep twirling the cup, you see a satyr. There's uh, a panther of Dionysus at left and there's Dionysus himself, uh, uh, this very uh, interesting, yeah, extremely uh, effeminate version of Dionysus that shows him uh, with, again, this, this, this Eastern mythologized sort of uh, a turban wrap that the um, Romans and the Greeks uh, represented Dionys Dionysus with. Uh, we have Ambrosia at left as a nymph uh, who was uh, also fallen victim to King Lycurgus. He was going to take the axe to uh, Ambrosia but then she beseeched uh, Dionysus and Mother Earth and caused all these vines to come up and entwirl around Lycurgus. And we see King Lycurgus here, uh, who incidentally, this idea of taking an ax, we see him cleaving his own foot. <laughs> uh, and it says... Um, that Dionysus, uh, so Liber, L-I-B-E-R, Liber, uh, uh, like liberty is another uh, Roman name for the god Dionysus. So Lycurgus drove Liber from his kingdom when he denied that Liber was a god and he had drunk wine. And in his drunkenness, uh, Lycurgus tried to violate his mother. Then he tried to cut down the vines because he said that wine was bad medicine. And it affected the mind. <laughs> so early teetotaler, right? Under madness sent by Lieber, he killed his wife and son. And, and Lieber threw Lycurgus himself to his panthers uh, on Rhodopia mountain of Thrace, over which he ruled. He's said to have cut off one of his feet, thinking it was a vine. <laughs> so interesting that that's all represented. This, uh, I've got a video here to show you what's also magnificent about this cup is that it's, um, it also, it, it itself can undergo this transformation. It's called a dichroic, whether light reflects off the surface or shines through the glass. If it reflects off the surface, it's green. If the light, light shines through the glass, it turns red. So this interesting transformative 
property to the glass itself is, uh, is, is really something, uh, quite, a, quite a spectacle that we have here. So, what, and it's interesting, you know, whether it was, mm, does, what, why, why choose this transformation of green to red? Is it some mm, association of, of the power of the grape to turn from the green on the vine to the red in your cup? Um, it's, it's really all sp um, speculative. But the other thing that might burst our bubble is that perhaps this was actually just an oil lamp and not a wine cup. But anyway, it makes for a great story. Uh, the, the idea of the ancient Greeks, I mean, the Greeks and Romans, they didn't, I mean, they didn't have this refined understanding of the whole uh, microbial fermentation process they, of that we, we understand that yeast turns sugars into alcohol and creates uh, this, this fermented drink. Uh, they, they knew there was something to yeast uh, and uh, they knew how to make wine, how to make beer, etc. And so they knew the fermentation process, just didn't necessarily understand the, the microbiology of all of it. I mean, we didn't really understand that until really well into the 19th century with Louis Pasteur. But we do have some great quotes. Plutarch, an ancient Roman historian, he says that yeast is itself also the product of corruption. It produces corruption in the dough, that's bread, uh, with which it's for mi mixed. And uh, for the dough becomes flabby and inert. And altogether, the process of leavening seems to be one of putrefaction. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, it goes too far and it completely sours and spoils the flour. So this was Plutarch's idea of, of fermentation and what yeast could do, this idea of, of corruption, uh, putrefaction, all of that. Another uh, ancient Roman uh, author, Theophrastus of Lesbos, he tells us that uh, they even, referring actually to the Egyptians, they even turn into drinkable juices some products which they have caused to depart from their nature and have somewhat rotted, such as those who make wines from barley and wheat and the so-called zuthus of Egypt. So that's interesting, the idea that fermentation causes these this, this uh, grain, barley and wheat, to depart from their nature. So that, that's an interesting idea. You know, at, at risk of um, projecting maybe some modern <laughs> enculturation on antiquity, uh, beer and wine enjoy this similar transformative role in our own society. For example, you know, thinking of alcohol as this transformative love potion, magic hat number nine, right? Number nine, the love potion number nine. I don't know. I mean, I'm going out on a limb there, but, uh, and then the idea that we, we, we toss around this colloquialism of having beer goggles. You know, if you drink too much, if you begin to see things perhaps not as they are, or it transforms your mind into seeing things the way they, uh, uh, the, maybe that you wish for them to see or such. So, but this, you know, the big question is why? Why uh, beer and wine and fermented drink in the ancient Greek world was equated with, with transformation? Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Greeks don't give us that answer. Maybe it has to do with simply this idea of fermentation, uh, this uh, turning barley into beer turning grapes into wine to the ancient mind could, could, if you're unfamiliar with what's happening, could be nothing short of, of magic. Uh, we were think of Plutarch and Theophrastus, those quotes, how uh, yeast is this product of corruption and it produces corruption, a departure from nature, putrefaction. So maybe is it the drinker drinking this beverage that's created through this this departure of nature putrefaction etc that uh, corruption through some sympathetic magic will will the drinker then uh, consume and, and 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 don that kind of uh magical effect transforming the drinker from human into something more corrupt like the beasts of the wild you know and it can be a, a baneful uh, uh, thing such as with well what happens to uh, Odysseus's men transformed into pigs or uh, with the, the eye cup turning you into this beast or it could be a blessing like the maenads are uh, the god comes within them through their reverie uh, enthused by the deity so yeah interesting um interesting uh, 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 ideas that are circulating throughout ancient Greece. And we don't have all the answers, but it's definitely, it's more than just a uh, coincidence uh, of all of that. So, 
Well, I think we've, we've gosh, come to the end of our hour, um, but uh, certainly happy to entertain any questions. People are very welcome if you want to unmute yourselves and, uh, and ask questions if you'd like. Um, I can, uh, I'm gonna, maybe I can stop this, this screen share here and um, glance through if we have any questions in the, in the chat box here. Uh, so uh, I'll probably, I don't know, I go in reverse order here, but to, to look, scan for question marks. And if you th tossed a question into the chat, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the question here. I might also glance over to our Facebook Live and see if we got any uh, questions there, or that's almost just too difficult. <laughs> but um, love potion number nine. Yeah, oh, uh, Walter Bauman's asking love potion number nine. You know, the, the song, right? Who, who wrote that song? I've got it uh, right here. Somebody can chime in and sing it as well, right? It was... Uh, 1959 by the Clovers, more famous by the 1963 cover by the Searchers. Uh, we're all going down memory lane there now, right? <laughs> nice. Just scanning for any more questions here, maybe in the, in the chat box here. So. Decoration on the inside of a vessel is less common than on the outside of a vessel. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I don't really have those numbers um, as far as like, um, yeah, what's more prevalent. Um, it, uh, I've seen plenty of yeah, vessels that might only have, a, especially like these round kylix bowls that have simply a um, geometric pattern on the inside and a bit more of an intricate pattern on the decoration on the outside. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily go um, on a limb to say one is more prevalent than the other. You know, and there's a whole big uh, question that we can't really answer here is, is to what extent the ancient Greeks drank out of uh, painted ceramic or were those exclusively for uh, decoration or, uh, or funerary? And uh, mostly did they drink and, and eat um, from undecorated ceramic in life? And if they could afford it, they would skip the decorated ceramic and jump straight to silver and gold and bronze and things like that. Um, there's maybe a little evidence of that, but uh, yeah, the, the, um, we don't quite, uh, that's an interesting question that's still, still debated. Yeah. Um, so how many ounces <laughs> do you think these cups would hold? Yeah, uh, Kylix cups, those, those bowl shaped ones uh, range tremendously in size actually. So um, there are, are very large ones, uh, you know, maybe a foot wide or more and then small ones. Uh, but when they get to be too large, it's rather unwieldy. Um, there's, I think there's, there's a whole paper written by someone on, uh, on just the, the, uh, doing a, 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 a study on uh, uh, recreating Kylix cups and, and trying to drink from them and which ones are easier to drink out of. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah, how much they could hold though. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd have to double check on that, yeah. Um, so maybe I missed this, but do we have an idea about the, the ABV, uh, alcohol content uh, of what they were consuming in ancient Greece? So yeah, I mean, and that, can, that could certainly range. It's, um, I think it, it's not difficult to easily brew up, uh, well, if you're talking beer and like ancient Egypt, brew up something to be upwards of 5%, that, that just, you know, that just happens. <laughs> uh, but in ancient Egypt, and wine, of course, could easily go into the double digits. However, in ancient Greece, they would almost unanimously, and during the classical period, um, they, they would uh, water down their wine, in a manner of speaking, blend wine with water. We have, uh, especially among the foppish aristocrats of classical Athenian society who are participating in these 
symposiums, the, the symposia, they would water down their, their uh, uh, wine. And the ratio could be a bit different. Um, it's, it's a, it was kind of up to the host, um, but uh, yeah, typically it might be maybe uh, like two to one or three to one, three parts to one uh, water uh, being the, the, the larger part. Uh, and so, yeah, we water it down just to, uh, uh, you know, a handful of percent. So, you know, you could party longer <laughs> uh, without uh, getting quite as inebriated. The um, interesting thing they did, uh, the ancient Greeks did have at the beginning of a symposium, they would often have a, a small toast of non-diluted wine as a, um, like this, this idea of this, um, foreshadowing of the process to come, the party to come, this, this dangerous uh, idea of drinking uh, straight undiluted wine, potent, fully potent wine was, uh, yeah, this interesting kind of, uh, um, well, it was, it was a toast to Dionysus, but it was also uh, this, this idea of, of running a risk. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. And they thought it was rather barbaric to, um, to drink straight undiluted uh, uh, wine. That was something, you know, those, those, those German barbarians and such would, would be doing. Uh, so yeah, why turning into pigs and other uh, creatures of the sorts, um, you know, and, and that probably ties in also with uh, sacrificial animals, the types of animals that would be sacrificed to the gods on altars um, are these, these, these beasts, these, you, by consuming, the gift of the God, you in essence are somewhat sacrificing yourself. So equating yourself with a sacrificial victim. I'm just making this up right now, but it sounds really good, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, lots of great questions here. Love that drinking glass. Maybe called a kylix. When you bring it to your mouth, it looks like a face. Yes, right. That, yeah, yeah. A lot of those at the in, in different museum collections. These these eye cups. You hold them up to your mouth, and, and definitely. Um, did they add ice? Um, <laughs> yeah. Wink. Okay. Great. <laughs> yep. Wonderful. So, um, last question here, maybe. Whiskey drinkers, hey, hey, Whis uh, get whiskey drinkers to blow their cool by telling ancient Greek wine drinkers, water it down. Rutting beasts, right? Yes, yep. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, I, uh, I think we're going to wind it down. We're a little past the hour here. Uh, I do want to, before we head on out, uh, I definitely want to let you know we, we have one session left in our, uh, our libations series coming up next week. Same, same place, same time. Well, actually different link. So different place, same time, uh, but streaming through, through Zoom and the Chicago Museum Facebook page. Uh, the, next week we have uh, in our, our fourth and final installment of the uh, libation series, Rebecca Raspberry, the um, owner of the Vibrations Cafe and Juice Bar in uh, Gary, Indiana, is gonna be speaking uh, to us about the benefits and healthful benefits of, uh, of juicing and uh, a healthful detox um, uh, from alcohol, so and uh, other herbal uh, remedies and teas and such. So I think it's, it, along this whole idea of libations, libations celebrates much more than just intoxicating alcoholic beverages. And uh, many of us choose not to uh, indulge in alcohol or might choose to do. There's a strong phenomenon of the dry wary, right? having a dry January, or Jan February, February, <laughs> uh, or is it January? I don't know. Can you tell? I've never done. So um, yeah, so the idea of, uh, of, of, of juice and teas and such, we're going to have that conversation next week. You can check out chicagobrisium.org. You'll find a link to that. And uh, while you're there, do uh, scroll on down, visit the YouTube page, Chicago Brisium YouTube page and subscribe uh, and check out all the great videos that we've got there. Also, I, I want to be sure to say, you know, the Chicago Brisium and Sacred Transformations, certainly my thanks to both of them for the, the partnership and the collaboration of bringing this libation series together and uh, all being done uh, 
for free um, uh, during this, this period of uh, physical isolation, but you know, trying to keep us socially connected. That's what the virtual happy hour is all about. So visit Sacred Transformations, visit uh, tattooarttherapy.org. That's the Sacred Transformations website. Donate, visit chicagobrazium.org, donate, um, support these, these great resources. Thank you all so very much for, uh, for joining this hour. Cheers and uh, hope to see you next week. All right. Thank Very you, good. Lucas. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Lucas.